And, uh, uh, yeah, this is really exciting. I'm really pumped. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, you guys for doing this diving deep dessert deal. That's awesome. And this is an awesome space, and I'm hoping that I give you something, a little piece of something that maybe, um, that maybe gets you to try something. At the end of this, I'm going to pitch a module at you. And hopefully you will uh, grab onto that in the spirit of let's experiment and let's not worry about failing. Um, I've been doing a lot of writing and I, I want to talk about uh, owning your story and being able to understand your life uh, as a story and be able to tell that story in a way that promotes connection um, and possibly even healing um, as opposed to simply rattling on. What we're really talking about here is memoir. Memoir is a subgenre, a, a, a genre of writing, narrative of personal experience. By definition, it's autobiographical. You're writing about your life, okay? Something you've experienced directly. It's different from autobiography because it's not your whole life. You're not gonna give me your grandparents going across the tundra and building the first igloo and then they had your parents. You don't do that. You take a slice of your life, particularly a slice of your life that was kind of marked by transformation. Uh, a sudden awareness, something you figured out. It might have been something, and we'll talk about this in a bit, it might have been something fairly traumatic, or it might be something that you feel other people might benefit from learning from. Um, and the goal, really, of memoir, or of almost really any kind of expression, of course, is human connection. The goal here is to have your story heard. Um, I this, I've heard it said that people want human connection more than they want anything. And when they don't get their human connection, that's when they start branching into other areas, like suddenly they're obsessed with money, because if they think they get enough of that, they can have some human connection, or maybe fame, or power, or building the perfect train set, I don't know. But bottom line, I think all of us really want to be heard, we want to be seen, and we want to be understood for who we are. And in order to make that happen, we tell our stories. Um, there are all kinds of memoirs out there. It's actually a hugely popular uh, genre, and some people have sort of been remarking that they feel like there are a lot more memoirs now than there used to be. I don't think that's true. I think people have been cranking out memoir for just ever. We got U.S. Grant and Eleanor Roosevelt up there. Ernest Hemingway, this is sweet. Read this one. This is a little slice of time he spent in Paris as a, basically a penniless author. Um, there's some terrific stuff. Elie Wiesel Knight, um, uh, Mr. Peck and I taught that last year in our Holocaust class. So again, these are stories that are sort of pieces of a life, transformative pieces of a life. And the sub-sub-genre of memoir deals specifically with healing. In other words, they're stories told by people who have had to confront profound trauma, uh, a profound challenge. And they not only overcame it, but writing the book was in some way part of that healing. Learning to tell their story in some way helped them heal from it. These examples up here, I kind of pulled off at random, I don't know if there's anything to jump out at you, but confessions of a trauma therapist. I mean, that's somebody who sits there for a living and listens to other people unburden themselves of pain. Um, the one in the upper right is uh, pers borderline personality disorder. What the, what's it like to live with that? Um, there's somebody who's traumatized by their uh, religion of birth. There's somebody who worked through uh, losing their twin. Um, so there's sort of a sub-genre of this where people are writing, not just to get their story out there, but to get their hands around their story in a way that empowers them to move through their pain. And this is where I come in with this, because this is the kind of writing that I've done. Um, and I'll tell you my story briefly. Uh, this is the basic substance of my first book. That's my older brother there. Uh, his picture was taken just last year. Um, <laughs> kidding. Sorry. Uh, this is my older brother, David. Uh, he was five and a half years older than me, and um, uh, we were incredibly similar people. And, uh, and probably the closest, I have two, we have two siblings that were older. Uh, the two of us really were pretty tight, uh, as far as my family goes. In 2009, uh, he took his own life. Uh, he, he committed suicide. And um, that was shocking. Uh, and I don't know if any of you have had your lives touched by suicide. I think some of you probably have. Statistically, you have. Um, you go through a lot of things. You go through, uh, obviously, shock. You go through deep grief. You go through anger. You get so, I get so mad at him for a while. Just, ah. You go through um, rage. Uh, you go through um, guilt. 
You know, there's, it actually floats through your head and you say, oh, I should have been able to prevent this. I should have been there. I should have just psychically known that he was going to do this and stopped him somehow. This is all stuff you need to work through and it's all pretty predictable. The one thing that happened that, that occurred to me in all this that was not predictable was when he, when he killed himself, the, one of the first things that went through my mind was, why haven't I? David and I were really similar people. I've said that. He struggled with all kinds of darkness. He struggled with all kinds of shame and unhappiness and depression. And so did I, okay? This is, we were raised pretty much in the same family unit. We were coming from the same place. So I had to ask the question, why haven't I? And in answering that, I dug back about nine years to a time when my wife and I bought a house in McLean, Virginia. And this house was dumb. This house was sold to be torn down, okay? Tear it down, clear it out, build your new house. We couldn't afford to do that, so we ended up rehabbing this house. The family who lived there before us, they were the original owners. They lived there for 45 years or so. This family had blown up, just blown up. The father had dropped everything, left, moved in with his secretary and started the second family. The mother uh, had descended into alcoholism. The oldest son, as soon as he could, got the hell out and never looked back. There was a daughter in there somewhere that nobody even knew where she was anymore. The younger son, a guy almost exactly my age, stayed in the house with his mother and they drank themselves unconscious every night. They completely neglected the house. Um, and when they, the mother eventually died in the house, uh, when that family got itself out of there, they left everything behind. So imagine all the stuff that's in your house right now, like in the basement, files and clothing and pictures, it was all there. And we had to clean it out. So I spent a summer carrying the debris of this broken family out to a dumpster, okay? Um, needless to say, you do that for a while. When you first start doing that, my first take on that was really judgy. This family just, they, they, they blew up, they're ridiculous, you know? They couldn't handle it. They, 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 they're wrong, they're, they're, they're weak, they're frail, they're flawed, they're whatever. After about a month or two of that, I realized I had a whole lot more in common with these people than I would normally have liked to admit. And in fact, I started feeling enormous compassion for them. In the process of this, I began to confront the fact that I had lived most of my life with depression. That in fact, what had gone wrong here was in me, okay? And I got to a place with this where I started to examine my own childhood and I started to examine how I'd gotten to where I was. And I realized that if I didn't ask for help, I was gonna lose everything. I was gonna lose my wife and children. I was gonna lose my job. I was possibly gonna lose my life. I needed to do something to pull myself out of this. So I did, I asked for help. And that whole process, I started writing about it. And uh, it took me about many years, really, to put it together. And that really is the story of this book. And the premise of the book really is, uh, I was buried, I was buried in depression and shame. Um, I was carrying the seeds of this destruction within me for an ongoing time, I still do, to a fair amount. But I needed to ask somebody for help. And that's basically where the story sort of climaxes and ends. Uh, it's been really nice to have that book out there. I've done almost nothing to promote it. But people seem to keep finding it. And uh, every year I'm, I'm brought back to my old high school on the East Coast and they have me there as part of their mental health week and I present on that and talk to kids about depression and what to do about that. Um, and like that, so I put it out there. The act of writing this was hugely healing for me. It forced me to sit down and really look at what had gone on and really look at who I was and the decisions I'd made about myself. It was intense and I went through many, many drafts and many, many, I don't know, I, I could still go back and change that book around a whole lot. But the act of doing this all by itself, if no one had ever read it, would have been enormously helpful to me. I ended up publishing it because I did show it to a friend of mine, a guy roughly my age. And he said, you know, you really should publish this because there are a whole lot of people out there who need to read this. So I did. And it turns out, I think he was kind of right. So, uh, so that's my experience with this. And I want to encourage you guys to look into this kind of writing, even if it's just for yourself, even if no one else will ever see it. And before you, you know, I think I suggest that to a few people, right? So I'm talking to you and you're like, I can't write, right? Let me, uh, let me lay out three specific blocks 
that we can talk about and blow up. The first block is I have no story to tell. Okay. Um, Abby has been in my public speaking class. Lucas is in my public speaking class. Lee is there. Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> you really have stories to tell. They come in the first week and I'm like, tell me your story. And they're like, I got nothing. And like three weeks later, I'm hearing amazing things from people. Your experiences matter. Okay. Your experiences, your feelings, the conclusions you've drawn from your experience, what you feel you've learned, this matters. We go back to the human connection bit. This is what ties you into the rest of the human race. You have a story to tell. And if you don't think you've had a story, that means someone else has been telling you. Um, this happens. You guys are on the younger end of things, and um, that means other people have been telling your story. You might have, uh, I don't know, you might have your dad talking about that time. You know, you always run into the house. When you were seven, you always run into the house, you knock the stuff over, and we say, slow down, and you never slow down, right? And, and that's, that was just you. You're just like that. You're always rushing places. Or you've got the grandmother who's like, there was that time when you were four, and you just gave me the sweetest hug. And, and that's just who you are. You're a sweet person. You're just a really sweet person. That's who you are. Well, that's their story of you. That's not your story. For the first one, you might just remember back to a time when you were six or seven and you were like, it was so cool just to be alive. Just to be like, ah, you wanna get out of the house, right? You're just going berserk. And it's not that you're disobedient or bad. It's that you couldn't wait to get out there and live a little. Or maybe you were, when you were three or four, grandma got it wrong, you wrecked. You want the sweet spot. And the way you get the sweet spot is you realize that everybody in your story is doing their absolute best. I didn't get my parents until I became a parent. All of a sudden, I realized just how hard that work was, okay? That got me a little bit more into the sweet spot because I started out being very one-up to my parents. They screwed up, okay? And the more I started to dig, the more I began to realize that they were doing their best and I was making decisions about myself that weren't particularly healthy, okay? It's an interesting process, but ask yourself, what are you writing for? If you're writing for revenge, you're one up. If you're writing just to, I gotta tell my story here, just use like, maybe you're a little boundaryless at this point, okay? Maybe you wanna rethink that. If you're writing about what happened, but you have absolutely no emotional stake in it, it's not on the page, you're probably walled up. It's probably not gonna be a very good read either. Are there any questions about this? What do you guys think of this? We actually had this posted on our fridge when our kids were little, and they go up and point to it. Say, where are you today? Maybe like, oh, I'm over here. It's pretty interesting. Is this, does this resonate at all again? I have a question, Mr. McKinley. So yeah. I, I haven't read your book. Um, well, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> but my question is that do you feel like in your book you're usually in the sweet spot? Or are there moments when you're kind of on either side and it kind of averages out? That's a great. Um, but by the time I published it, final edit, I really did everything I could to be in the sweet spot. My sister, I think, actually confirmed that for me. She read it, and she said, you know, I don't remember a lot of this stuff the way you seem to, but she said, this is clearly your truth, and I think you're right on the money with it. Yeah, that's a good question. Was that hard? Was that? Was that hard? Extremely, but that's also where the healing is. Do you know what I'm saying? If you can confront dark stuff that you've lived through, and you can put yourself there, I think that's healing, right? You're not being triggered, you're not being thrown off, and out of your, you know, out of your zone. Um, it's, it was really helpful. But no, some of the early drafts, brutal. Brutal. And you need to work through that. You know, if somebody's done you wrong, be pissed at them. It's fair, right? That's a decent first reaction. But then the more you work it through, maybe the more you see why they're coming from. You see why they're doing what they're doing. What you might see is that they, you have nothing to do with it. They just happen to be in their way when they were working through something else. Um, yeah. Can I follow up? Go! Because I'm curious, because like, how do you, if, if originally you wrote that to not really publish it, not right. to see it, how do you judge yourself on it? Because like yeah. I think of myself personally as one up and walled off. Yeah. And so I would be a horrible judge of anything that I wrote. Because right. I think it's better than everybody else's stuff. Yeah. Um, and, I, <laughs> yeah. and I don't have your opinion. I hear you. So how does that, how do, how do you? I think it? I got to a place, I worked in this book, I was actually writing a version of this before my brother killed himself. So I worked on this book for close to 10 years, okay? I kept it real close for the first eight. I got to a place with it where I was, first of all, I was obviously obsessed with it, 
You know, I just couldn't stop writing. We moved like three times. I'm raising small children and I'm still doing this into the night, right? Um, I did get to a place where I wanted to show it to my wife. Um, uh, I wanted her to read it because it was stuff we were sort of talking on anyway. And then when I got to the place where I had asked for help, then I'm thinking more therapeutically and she's my partner in that. Do you know what I'm saying? And she was awesome because she knew what I wanted to say and she'd be able to go, you haven't said it yet. You know, this doesn't read like what you really want to be saying. So you can't, you can't write a memoir then without that person for I, I'm going to go on a limb, so I got artists sitting here. I'm not, I've never been able to create anything that affects other people without some feedback earlier in the process. It just doesn't jump out of your head, guys. It's not, you know, it's like the Athena, the goddess of wisdom jumping fully formed out of Zeus's head. That's not the way it works, okay? You need to work it through. You need to get it to a place where you can share it. I wish we'd set that up. That was awesome what you just did. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question because that might be a fourth block. It's got to be perfect the first time I write it. Bull cookies. It won't be perfect the last time you write it, okay? Just write it. It's not about perfection, all right? That's great. Thank you, Mr. T. Uh, real quick, I want to open this up to you guys now and, and, and start to pitch this this opportunity for you to try this. Uh, I think the beauty of what Mrs. Vogley has put together and, and what we create and modules can do is that we can do a really low stakes, just get a taste for this. You don't have to worry about it being perfect. You don't have to worry about being any damn good at all because nobody's ever really gonna read it, okay? But this is an opportunity for you all to experiment with addressing an experience you had. By the way, it could be a great experience. It could be a time you won the World Cup or whatever. I don't know, it could be something awesome. Or it could be something maybe not so. Try to do this in memoir. And for me, it starts, I love the idea of a six word story. I ran this through class today. Six word story, there's some folklore about this. Anybody taking Mr. Shields classes? No, he does this in class, I think, doesn't he? I guess. Um, it all started, the story, I don't know if this is true. Ernest Hemingway, American author, uh, took a bet. A guy bet Hemingway that Hemingway could not write a six-word story that would make this guy cry. Hemingway being Hemingway said, of course I can. And this is the story he wrote. Uh, Leah, did you read that? For sale, bank issue, never What do you think? What kind of story is that? What do you think, Kate? Uh, are you asking me, like, what Wait, I what's think? your reaction? What, what do you feel? Well, what do I feel or, like, what I think about what he's trying to say? How about what do you feel? Why well, is sad? Yeah. Then, this is really sad. Now, what do you think about what he's trying to say? Well, I think he's saying that his wife had a miscarriage. And... You just invented that completely, right? I mean, there's so many possibilities here, yeah. right? But that's when you immediately jump to something. You connect to this. Right? There's a connection here. There's a story waiting to be told. Okay? Um, and people have applied this concept to memoirs specifically. And I know this because it has to be true because I found this online. So, you know, there you have it. <laughs> these are a half dozen examples from a website that's purporting to say these were written by teenagers. Okay, so people roughly your age. Hey, Rachel, read the first one. All authors always get back up. What's that story about? Yeah. Yeah, a little resilience, right? Can you connect to that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope you could, right? The person is also implying they're not perfect. I'm not perfect, but you know, when I screw up, or I get whacked down, I get up again. That might be a story you want to read, right? Uh, who wants to do the second one? Somebody do number two. Go for it, Abby. I became an adult too fast. Ouch, what kind of story? Growing up too fast. Yeah, some regrets. Right? And again, our imaginations go nuts. We're like, what happened? We want to know. Um, important person now gone, missing them. I'm not sure that there's a human being on the planet who hasn't been there. This is the connection part. We want to hear that story. That's your story to tell. Tell it. I love the fourth one. Mr. Peck, read that one. We're the family you gossip about. Bam! Okay, I love that. It's kind of cocky almost. We're really weird, all right? Let me tell you about a weird family I got going. Google what he called me. Ouch. Wow, there's a story there. 
And the last one, I think, if you can't connect to this last one, I don't <laughs> think you really go to boarding school. <laughs> okay. Send money. I'm begging you. So here's the pitch, gang. Here's the pitch. Memoir module. And spot me on this, Ms. Vogley, because I'm actually not going to have anything to do with it. This is Mr. Peck and Ms. Vogley. Um, but what they'd like to get from you guys, if you're interested in doing this, is a proposal. I added the complexity of the six-word memoir. I think it'd be really cool if you wrote one and then took it to Mrs. Vodley or Mr. Peck and said, you know, this I think might be the beginning of my story. This might be what I want to write about. But they might not require you to do this. You, you go to them and you'll say, you know what, I want to write a memoir. And you'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them where you'll, they'll we'll talk to you about, well, how, how, many, how long every day do you plan to write? Notice this is not word count. If you're a little tight about your writing, this is not word count. We're not saying you have to write a thousand words a day, okay? If we made you write a thousand words a day, it'd be really bad writing. You will write at your own pace. You're gonna dedicate time to this and see what you make of it, okay? It only lasts like a week and a half. And the memoir remains private. What you write, you're the only one who will read it. That's critical. I didn't really emphasize that in the early stages of this. So maybe you picked this up when I was talking to Mr. G. In the early stages of this, you don't show this to people. This is just for you. This is for you to make sense of your story. This is what I mean by owning your story. You work it out, you inhabit it, and you pick it apart and put it back together again. That's private, that's on you. You don't have to worry about anybody judging it. You don't have to worry about anybody having their feelings hurt. You don't have to be worried about anybody, any feedback whatsoever. You're gonna write a memoir. Then at the end of this time, and you'll have negotiated that, November 8th is the date, I guess, You'll, you will complete, you will write, and you'll negotiate how long it is. Mr. Peck, I don't know how long you want these things to be, but I guess that's one-on-one -on -one as well, right? Where you reflect on the process. How did this feel? What did you learn? What did you not? What was hard? What are you walking away with? I took 10 years to work on my book, and I walked away with being a much healthier human being. In a week and a half, you might just get a taste, you might get a little taste. I was able to go back to a time, you might find some real gold here, and that might be part of your reflection. Your reflection might also be, you know what? I think I'm gonna stick to research papers. Okay, you know, but get a taste for this. The stakes are awfully low. And you might find yourself after this keeping a journal. You might find yourself after this really using the written word to sort out your life. Okay? Any questions? I think I'm done with my, that's, that's what I had prepared for you guys, so. I just want to add something. So there are a number of you who are not juniors and are not required to do modules. You are welcome to partake in this experience as well in, um, in a partnered way if you'd like. So the module, uh, Mr. Peck or I will work with people who are doing the module. I would be happy to do that with um, people who want to go through this process but don't have to do a module as well. Great, yeah, I mean, really open this up. And, yep. and you don't, I know you guys don't feel like you have a whole lot of free time, and some of you really don't. But this is, you know, this is something for you. Uh, you can really feel pretty good about it. And if any of you want to ask me more about what I've talked about, or if you want to run something past me, I am also available, okay? Uh, email, what have you, we can get together. Whatever needs sorting out. Any questions before we wrap up? I think we did this, is it, it's three o'clock? When did this class end, it's right? Yeah, what time is it? I don't have the time. To Actually, you guys, most of you guys are blind things. It's two minutes. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Oh, that was like perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So for the guests, yeah, I'm right here. Have another blondie. Yeah, Enjoy the party, kids. Is it Nick? Yeah. Have some more blondies now, Nick. Careful. Are you okay? Uh, it's the, the next thing. <laughs> <laughs>